with us here today. Um, my name is Gavan Topolsky. We're going to be talking today about the Myonix, which is Top Technologies' uh, newest and latest uh, biofeedback device and electrostimulation. Uh, I am, as I said, Gavan Topolsky. I'm the product manager for anything physical rehabilitation here in, at Top Technology. I've been working on this device for the last couple of years. With us, we also have our uh, resident genius, the guru of uh, biofeedback, master of uh, EMG, uh, Mr. Pedro Tejera. I'm sure you have a, a better introduction for yourself, Pedro. Wow. <laughs> After that one, I don't think I want to talk. It was uh, for me to be able to work with Kiva on helping develop these. Assisting us with anything uh, clinical uh, oriented. I myself am also a physiotherapist. Uh, born, raised, and educated in Israel, and I've been with uh, Thought Technology for the last uh, four years now. So uh, let's uh, get started. Before we and we can't hear you, we do very much encourage questions and want you to send those in as you get those. If you were to look at the Go to Meeting control panel, usually found at the upper right of your computer monitor, you're going to notice there's a questions tab right in there. If you open up that tab, you can type in any sort of question you want, and that'll send to us. As we go along through this presentation, we're going to be keeping track of these questions and then we're going to be asking them at certain opportune times. Some of the more technical stuff, we might answer the question immediately. For more clinical based, we have a time period at the end of the presentation when we'll go over those as well. Just to make sure that you all can see the questions box, I'd like you just to type in just a moment, hello, hi, or let us know what the weather's like where you are. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people who are from much sunnier parts of the world right now here, not all covered in snow like the rest of us. But just take a moment to type something in just so we know that you can communicate with us. There's someone who's very, very quick, who's already uh, sending messages. Robertus, hello, everyone. Uh, the individuals, Guy, Carlos, Ahmed, hello, hello. Thank you very much. See, mm -hmm. clearly people know how to find these question tab quite easily. Excellent. Also, hello from Joan as well. Thank you very much, everyone. Mm -hmm. and. I'll be tuning in periodically as the presentation continues. So once again, thank you for joining us. Uh, I would like to start with a little bit of a background about uh, biofeedback, electrostimulation in general. I'm sure most of you are uh, somewhat familiar with the concepts, but just to go uh, through it quickly. So uh, with biofeedback, basically we are picking up any uh, type of endogenous um, signal from the body and we amplify it and use different methods to display it. So we can display it visually, we can uh, play a sound, we can uh, play games. Uh, so these, uh, these signals can be uh, anything from the body, starting with heart rate, uh, precipitation, um, uh, body temperature. In our case, uh, as physios, we're usually talking about EMG. Um, yeah. and, and this is the case here as well. There's something you wanted to add, Pedro? Uh, yeah, well, I was going to say that right from the start, it's really important that uh, we understand exactly what biofeedback is. And I think you're giving up uh, a good introduction about it. I just want to, uh, to tell a personal story that will, I think, allow persons to understand how powerful it can be. When I was started using SCMG, uh, I was still learning and I was, had my machine plugged into the, the wall and into the patient every time, regardless of what I was doing, just so that I could try and figure out what muscles were doing. And by looking at the information and showing to my patients what they were doing, I was able to, um, for the first time, have a much higher percentage of success uh, taking care of posture uh, conditioning. So persons with bad posture and uh, we were trying to train them, usually it hurts a little bit when you're not accustomed to contract a muscle to keep your back straight. And uh, therefore persons would do it in front of me, but as soon as they went home, they stopped doing it because it wasn't, uh, uh, it was an unpleasant thing. And uh, just by, by seeing what the signal uh, showing them that when they assumed the position that I was asking them, the site on the back that usually hurt uh, the, the, the muscle activity came down and wasn't being activated, um, they all of the suddenly started doing it at home, even though they didn't have feedback at home. 
So just those few moments of contact, of biofeedback, allow them to understand what I was trying to say to them uh, much better and then uh, made them want to replicate at home even though they weren't seeing any signal. So it was how I got convinced this is it, this is what I'm going to be doing from now on. Yeah, that's uh, very true and it, I, I think it, it speaks to the point uh, of, of the really powerful function of uh, biofeedback as a training tool. So obviously we have the, the assessment function of it, uh, which can, uh, sh we can sometimes show us the condition of the muscles, uh, the activation, and, and we can use it to kind of assess the progression of the patient uh, throughout the session. But uh, to me, and I think um, uh, Pedro agrees with me on that, the training function is the more important part here uh, with biofeedback. Just by showing the patient the, the signal, he learns how to uh, control it. Yeah, for sure. So assessment, as you will know and we'll see on the next slides, that uh, the signal that we are monitoring is a complex one and there's a lot of barriers that we have to come through in order to get a good signal. Uh, so assessment has been proven to be a successful one for certain conditions, but not all. But uh, training, uh, uh, can be used if a, if a muscle is involved, if there's voluntary contraction, and if the person is able to understand what he's doing and is able to activate that muscle. In my personal experience, biofeedback can be a useful tool. So assessment, uh, we'll see that we have for pelvic floor assessments that are considered to be uh, as good or better than uh, the golden standard Yes, and, especially and fortunately, for, fortunately for some other things, there are so many problems with the signal that we're not able for sure to tell from one session to the other, from one person to the other. We cannot compare with certainty, but it's also because we have a high standard of what we want to do with it, because most times in health, the subjectivity of it is tremendous. For, for example, we tend to think x-rays are uh, something that produces a result without a doubt that is always right, and it isn't the case at all. And it will vary a, a, a huge amount between physicians looking at the same yes. x-ray and uh, different conditions or the same condition will produce different results. We just don't have that's low standard for SCMG, unfortunately. But uh, just so that you can understand what we're measuring, we're measuring a signal that, uh, like Kiva said, is a physiological one, and it results from the activation of the muscle. So it's the depolarization of the muscle fiber. When uh, the central command reaches the muscle by uh, the motor neuron, of motor neuron, uh, it will create the depolarization on the part muscle fiber and that's what we're measuring and it's important to note that because even though it will translate into a muscle contraction a mechanical aspect of it it is before that so it correlates to force but we're not measuring force we're measuring activation of the muscle okay and this is really important because it allows us to access a little bit about neuromotor control which is key when looking at muscles, and it, which is the one of the things that uh, is really wonderful that to, to use this is to understand how muscles are working within a, a function and within them uh, between themselves. So if we have and usually have more than one muscle involved, we can look at uh, one or two muscles and uh, and have look at it and and have a much better picture of what is happening. And we usually, so it's a raw signal. Uh, so it's a, a CS signal that, uh, sorry, it's a signal that uh, usually we get it as a raw signal because the raw allows us to see uh, up and down, positive and negative. And this is really useful. And a machine that allows us to do this, like this one does, it's really, really useful because sometimes there's noise into the, into the signal and we can only, be certain of it if we're looking at raw. So for example, 
when we're looking at raw and we are we have noise from cables moving or electrics moving, the line instead of being above zero when a muscle is not contracting, it will move up. So it will allow us immediately to know that we're not monitoring activity from the signal by the noise. Okay. But of course it's a lot harder to understand and therefore we usually translate that into a uh, process signal, which uh, is the standard today to do this, is the RMS, the root mean square. And basically what we are saying to the signal using a mathematical formula is saying all of the positive and negative should be shown, all, all the positive and negative information should be shown only as positive. And then uh, the M in RMS means mean, which allows us to smooth the signal a little bit so that uh, it's not as jumpy and uh, it's easier to for us and for our, to the person we're training to understand. And uh, when, you're ha when you have a, a device like this, you can also look at spectral frequency, which is really nice and we'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. Yep. So, um... To, to put it in simpler terms, what we see here on the on the left side of the of the graph on top is the raw signal. So we see it has positive and negative values, and then the rectified one that turns into that's been turned into RMS is here on the right. And RMS is more quantifiable; it's easier to understand, whereas raw gives you more uh, information. Um, and to say one more thing, uh, it, EMG. Uh, is a very useful tool when we're looking at muscles that are not moving, when we're looking at isometric movements, accessory, small movements, uh, deep muscles like in pelvic floor, and things that are hard for the patient to see and quantify without uh, the device. Uh, very helpful in neurological uh, cases and spasticity uh, and things to that extent. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the other type of modality, sorry? You know, as, as I, I saw you pausing, I was going to just reassure you that I didn't have any help to say about that one. <laughs> yes, with the electrostimulation, uh, not uh, really uh, Pedro's field, uh, but we are all very much aware of uh, of what electrostimulation is and how it works. This is kind of uh, the flip side of uh, uh, EMG, I would say, uh, as um, in EMG, we're reading the electrical activity that's happening endogenously in, in our body, and with electrostimulation, we are actually administering that same uh, electrostimulation. It's a little different, of course, from the um, electrical activity in the body itself, uh, but the idea is to create the same kind of effect, where, which is uh, causing the muscle to contract. Um, of course, there are different types of uh, waveforms. Uh, with uh, this device, we went with the most classic one that can achieve everything we're trying to achieve, uh, which again is mostly uh, muscle activation. We can use this muscle activation uh, to uh, generate uh, blood flow. Um, we can use it to strengthen muscles, to work on endurance. Usually we're talking about uh, weak muscles, not in uh, athletes. Um, just so you know, the type of waveform for us is bipolar, biphasic, rectangular, and balanced, um, which is a very classic type of uh, waveform. Now, ETS is a combination of EMG and uh, stimulation. So ETS stands for uh, EMG triggered stim. Uh, the idea is we will ask the patient to reach a certain threshold and we'll follow that with reading the EMG. Uh, once the EMG signal reaches that threshold that we set for the patient, electrostimulation will kick in and assist with the completion of the movement. Now, this is a, a very uh, smart kind of modality. Uh, if we're thinking about neuroplasticity and motor learning, um, a lot of the times, <clears throat> usually I would say, I, I want uh, the patient to see his efforts translate into something uh, that makes sense. So if, if the patient is trying to um, contract his uh, biceps muscle, for example, and reaches a very minimal kind of threshold that I set for him, and then the electricity kicks in and helps him with that same motion, 
the mind sees that and understands and makes the connections so the neural pathways can be more easily rebuilt. Uh, this is uh, very helpful in uh, situations like post-stroke or uh, spinal cord injuries. Uh, yeah, um, for sure. Especially uh, when, uh, when there is uh, central damage and uh, our brain, the way it tries to get around it is looking for other areas of our uh, other cells that can do the work. Uh, it keeps trying by trial and error. And fortunately, our brain will only know that it's activating a muscle if it produces movement. So it needs the sensory information, uh, the proprioceptive information, in order to know that uh, it, uh, it has been successful on activating that muscle. And, uh, and therefore, if the activation is so small that it doesn't produce uh, information in the nerve endings on our joints or on the neuromuscular fuse too. It won't uh, be interpreted by the brain as being successful on activating that muscle and it will discard that cell and go into the other. But if we are able to do what Kiva just said, which is define a small threshold that doesn't produce movement, but it's a, a contraction, and then when it reaches it, the person hasn't been able to produce movement, but since we put some electricity into the muscle, it will make the mechanical uh, movement. So it will contract the muscle a little bit more. The information from the nerve endings will reach the brain and the brain will be reassured that, okay, this is a good cell. Let's try a little bit more. And we as clinicians, then we'll work on that like we usually do with the exercise we do when we're training someone to do this, but it will make it a lot faster and uh, much more efficient because we will be able to aug augment a little bit the threshold each time the person is successful. And by doing that, the brain will be trained to use that cell and use it a little bit harder and harder and harder until it's able to do it by itself. And from that point on, we won't need more electrical stimulation. And we have rehabilitated that function that was lost after brain damage. Absolutely. Very, very important um, modality for uh, um, neuroplasticity. Uh, in general, uh, to me at least, uh, but EMG and ETS are uh, two modalities that fit into the physical rehabilitation world very well because we keep talking about active treatment and keep the patient involved and, and having the patient be, take control of his, uh, of his therapy. And uh, while STEM has its place, uh, electrostimulation, I think EMG and ETS specifically uh, sh should have a larger and meaningful uh, place in our uh, treatment. And of course, uh, most specifically with uh, neurological conditions. Yeah, and when you have a machine like this one, so I was I I, I had the MyoTrack Infinity, and I used it with patients that were in condition. So the the steam itself is also a good thing to have because you can do the full recover cycle. So you can sustain contraction when the person is immobilized, uh, and don't lose, and by doing that, they aren't losing as much um, muscle. Um, tissue as they would if they weren't contracting and you can then incorporate that when uh, we start uh, working on function and uh, muscle activation uh, with a little bit more biofeedback and yeah so so having a device that allows us to do that uh, allows us to do the full cycle of rehabilitation I agree. It really takes you to the, through the entire cycle of uh, rehabilitation. You start with passive treatment and then assisted active and then move on to active uh, with EMG. So uh, for our device and why it's so much better than everything else out there, uh, this is the Myonix. This is a little guy. It's uh, small and portable. It has uh, two channels of uh, biofeedback currently EMG and uh, with the uh, options to expand in the future to other types of uh, biofeedback. It has four channels of electrostimulation, very powerful, go up to uh, 100 uh, microvolts. Um, 
and it has uh, all the two channels that do EMG are also capable of uh, ETS training. It is very small, as you can see, uh, palm sized, uh, portable. It's, uh, it has a rechargeable, uh, pretty powerful battery. You can uh, work with it uh, for most of your day without recharging. It has a slick, nice looks, a touch interface, a color screen. It communicates with uh, the computer and with tablets wirelessly through Bluetooth. Uh, and it can be updated in your house over the air anytime there's an update coming out. Um, so it has, we can use the, the Myonics in three different ways. As standalone, uh, all it does is gives me access, quick access, to the um, electrostimulation programs that are already included on the device uh, or electrostimulation programs that I create. I, I'll talk a little bit about that later. But from the device itself, this is all I can do. I can access these programs and run them on the spot. So for electrostimulation, I don't need to be connected to anything else. If I want to use the entire functionality of the device, I need to use it with the app. The app uh, comes with the device. Uh, you install it on your tablet by downloading it from the marketplace on Android. Um, the tablet app really gives you a connection to all the features of the Myonics. So you can do biofeedback, you can do ETS, uh, you can do STEM, you can create your own STEM programs. Um, and you can follow the, the sessions on the tablet as well as on the device. Remember, these are connected just by uh, Bluetooth. So this gives us uh, some room to play uh, with. A patient can be doing active things, walking away from us, walking towards us, things like that. And we can be sitting and looking at the uh, app while the patient listens to the cues from the device or uh, any combination that we desire. The app is very easy to use, and we'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, then the other way of using it is with the PC. Uh, the PC, the device connects to Cloud Technologies, a uh, well-known and established uh, software called the uh, Biograph Infinity. Uh, this software uh, is a little less intuitive, I would say, than the app and takes some, some knowledge, um, but it gives you a lot more power and you can create very sophisticated protocols and, um, and basically gives you more options for more power users. Uh, but the full functionality of the device is also available in the app itself. Um, there are two types. Uh, and this is, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry Giva. Yeah, I was going to say that this flexibility of being able to use it as a standalone with the with the tablet or uh, in front of a computer makes it a, a device that is really uh one of the kind because i, I don't know uh, most videos uh, at some point in life of this go into the field either because they have to treat persons at home or they actually go to the field uh, because they are with sport teams and stuff like that and having this portability is amazing and uh, being able to do steam even without anything else just that it's really really cool and then you can use the tablet to, to give them access to things while in the gym, which is really nice because you can move around from one to the other uh, and be really user friendly. And uh, and of course, sometimes and when you start doing SMG, um, of course, uh, you will want for sure to have the biofeedback, even though, like Eva said, it has a steeper learning curve. It's a one that I recommend everyone to go through because you will be able to have access to information that uh, you probably won't be able uh, to, uh, to to gain from uh, from doing with the standalone by itself. So I think it's complete. Uh, none of them is uh, and will be a substitute for the other, but I think that being able to use all the three is how you can be um, you can get the full game from it. For example, when you look at this and give and give a will go through this in more detail, just want to point out for one thing that the extended one allows you to do, which is the 2048 Hertz. This is a full 
a CMG signal. This is research material. So you can have a look at the full information of your SCMG. And, uh, and this will allow you, for example, to look at uh, spectral frequency, which is our signal is composed of many different action potentials. Each, act, each action potential has a specific frequency, and it's all of them together that will give us the raw signal. But with the 2048 Hz, you will be able to de decompose that and understand the power of each frequency. And this is really good, cool stuff because it will allow you to know, uh, for example, if a muscle is getting fatigued or not, or like some uh, authors have done, uh, I'm recalling a North American author that looked into polypus in the, in the throat, a speech therapy um, person that uh, by looking at the specific frequency, she was able to identify if the person had the polypus or not, just by looking at that, if the frequency as the specific range of the signal was uh, had more or less power. So being able to use this extended version, as you can see, we will allow you to get uh, access to things that uh, you can only do if you have uh, really, uh, uh, till now, it, it was only possible to do when you had a really expensive um, lab machine. So it's yeah. a really cool thing to have. Yeah, so so that's true. The uh, While we're trying to keep this device as simple to use and flexible and easy and clinically oriented, it is powerful enough, and especially the extended version, which gives us, like Pedro said, the uh, 2048 hertz uh, connection, gives us full power of very uh, complex signal and with the um, uh, biograph software, you can do very uh, specific uh, complicated calculations on that and see the composition of the signal and uh, um, which fibers are, are firing uh, first and, uh, and things like that. This is really um, medical grade, I would say research grade uh, equipment. Now, the difference between the two versions, uh, it, so the Myonix comes in, in a basic version and an extended version. The basic version basically only connects to the app and can uh, obviously uh, be worked as standalone. It only gives us access to the RMS signal uh, and uh, the um, connectivity is over 20 Hertz. While the extended version, which is a bit more expensive, uh, gives us also access to the raw signal using the PC and using and gives us a free version of the biograph uh, software with the rehabilitation suite uh, built specifically for that. And of course, everything that comes with biograph, which is developer tools and options to create your own protocols and, and look at any uh, type of information you would like. Mm -hmm. Moving on. So, of course, in the box, you get everything you need to start operating, including four lead wires, uh, some sample electrodes, power supply, and even a little uh, pouch to keep everything night, uh, neat and uh, organized in there. You can also always uh, buy additional accessories if something gets lost, uh, if you need extra um, electrodes, things like that. Now again, the, the key features, like we keep saying, of, of, of this device is it's, it's super simple, it's very flexible, so it gives us a lot of options while still staying simple, and behind all this, we do have a very powerful engine. So just some uh, examples for the simplicity of the device. It's um, app operated. The app is operated with uh, uh, swipe motion, zoom in, zoom out, drag and drop, things we're already very used to. It's one click operation to get to anything on the app. So if I wanna start biofeedback, all I have to do is click on biofeedback from the main menu and, and I already see the, uh, the signal in live. And then I can uh, play with all the settings that I want. Uh, if I want quick access to, like we said, the electrostimulation programs, I have that in the palm of my hand. I don't have to even connect it to the uh, app for that. Um, Connecting once you paired the device to your tablet and to your PC, you never have to worry about it again. The, device, the uh, tablet and the PC will recognize it immediately. 
Um, we have very few screens. We keep it very, very simple to change and switch between the dip different types of views. And the idea is to save time for the therapist uh, and uh, remove some of those, some of that uh, uh, long learning curves that we get with uh, other devices that are more complicated. Um, so that was simplicity. If we're talking about flexibility, we're, what, what I'm trying to say is you can really do very sophisticated things with this device, although it's that simple to use. So once you get uh, learn to use it a little bit and you get comfortable with it, you can start playing with all the, these different settings. You can change the, the goals and the challenges uh, in the in the app. So um, one classical, let's say, goal of uh, biofeedback is I give you a threshold and I tell the patient to start and try to reach that threshold, whether it's strengthening, so contract to reach above the threshold, or uh, relaxation, so uh, try to relax your muscles and reach below the threshold. Um, for example, with the Myonix app, we also have a kind of what we call dynamic thresholds. So these will jump uh, up and down and ask the patients to some of the time be above and some of the time be below. This gives you kind of a control game and a more sophisticated kind of uh, goal as a moving target. You also have um, animations with uh, scoring. So uh, it's like a game. The more uh, uh, whiteboard animations, you can see that on the right in a little bit. I think we, we have a view of that. The more whiteboard animations I get completed, uh, I increase my score here. We can see it right now. Um, you can select music um, to be on or off when you're uh, in condition or outside of condition. Um, we have pattern views, which you can uh, tells you stay within a given line. So really a lot of flexibility, a lot of options. You can have open sessions, you can have alternating sessions, and this goes also for STEM sessions. So not just biofeedback, uh, even with STEM, we have all the type of modulations, burst modes, um, the different types of uh, amplitudes. Very flexible, allows you a lot of uh, different options uh, for use. Uh, also. Uh, keep in mind the um, the fact that this device is wireless allows us to work in function. Allows us uh, we don't have to have the patients lying on the on the bed. We can have them uh, walking, exercising, sitting on a physio ball, and and uh, doing the measurements while doing that. So really gives you a lot of flexibility. Yeah. And like we said, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I, I just, yeah. Sorry. I, I just want to point out that the, the main thing that I didn't. See, uh, when uh, we, we started speaking about biofeedback, the most important thing when we're doing biofeedback is inf is the information. So we are trying to to have someone do something. So we want the information that we're giving them from the signal to be able to do exactly what we want them to do. So they need to understand and be engaged and motivated and uh, being able to change that quickly between different types of, of uh, animations or goals or ways to give feedback to someone is really, really wonderful because not everyone will respond to a line graph or a bar graph and, uh, and therefore it will allow you to on the fly adjust your session to your specific patient instead of being always the same thing to everyone and, and always the same same thing every time. So at some point, it starts not being so motivational as it should. Yeah, I'm just popping on the screen here uh, for a second, my um, app right now that is connected to my forearms. And we can see the first view of biofeedback. It's kind of a line graph. Of course, here I can drag and drop the um, threshold lines and I can uh, change the, the view. I remove auto scale, I can zoom in or zoom out. Um, but also very, very easily, just by swiping on the screen, I can change into bar graph view if I prefer that. I can change into animations. And then animations uh, while the session is run, I'll, I'll start a session right in a second and we'll see how the animations work. Uh, we also have this pattern view, which requires the patient to remain within the line. The setting is pretty hard. And of course, we have different types of patterns to select from, and we can even create our own. What we see on the right there is channel B. 
So usually we use it as a control channel. Uh, now, if I'll go back to animations and uh, run a session for a second, we will be Our able to see. So as long as I'm in condition, which for right now is stay above the threshold, the animation will work. If one channel drops out of condition, it will pause. And we have many different types of animations. And again, I'm just swiping on the screen to change between those. So the idea is, again, to give you as many uh, options for viewing as possible. Um, yeah. make, make it and a little bit more fun, a little bit more engaging. Yeah. One key thing that I think is worth pointing out, Giza, is that yeah. you, now you're using both above, but you could use one above, one below. And this is yes. really cool because you can be looking at an agonist and an antagonist muscle and, uh, and working them properly. Or you can be looking at a shoulder where you know that at till some point you want one of them to be more activated, the lower trapezius, and then at some point have the upper trapezius going up. So you can play with that also. Absolutely. Really yeah. Absolutely. So we can have the, the, the channels are completely separate. I can have one condition uh, be above threshold and the other condition be below threshold. I can have them both below, both above. I can connect one channel or connect two. And all of this I can do with EMG and with ETS as well. I have actually a question coming in from the audience, and one one of the individuals is wondering: Do both of the systems uh, save sessions and, and and maintain progress reports, or is that only so, available with one of the systems? So both uh, systems save sessions and generate progress reports. Um, I would say the app version is more of a kind of. Uh, let me show you the the report that comes from the app. Um, it's kind of more of a simple report. Uh, as you would expect from an app. Right now, I'm, I'm looking at the, the session I just did, and I click Generate Report, Generate Preview. And this is the report you get on the app. It's a PDF file. Uh, it has the patient name, the, the therapist name. It has the views of the session. Right now, they're both the same. But if I zoom in on the preview screen to one of them, I will get the full session on the left. And on the right, the zoomed in part, I get all the session statistics. And then with this, I can uh, share it with any app I have on the tablet, or I can print it directly from the tablet or save it as a PDF locally. With the biograph, uh, and I can't right now show that, uh, you get more sophisticated, complex reports, and you can create your own and make and decide what you want to look at. Uh, so that's the difference, but they both save sessions um both locally and on the myonix hardware device if you wish as well and uh and they both let you save it under a patient file review it later generate reports and things like that yeah. thanks kevin and even though you say it's a simple one i i understand why because when you go to biograph you are able to do a lot more but mm -hmm. when i look at that that's probably what most uh, physicians would like to see so after doing a session with that you could be immediately sending it to the person who has referred your client to, mm -hmm. and he could be on the loop right immediately without you having to fuss around with anything else, just clicking that button and then there it goes. So, Biograph will allow you to do really cool stuff, uh, and, uh, and, uh, but, but I think that one is a powerful one you have in there. Yeah, absolutely. Most of the information you would want is definitely on the app-generated uh, report. Um, okay, so uh, again, just to talk about the power, like we said, very strong battery, good Bluetooth connectivity uh, that's been tested again and again under medical uh, conditions. Um, stimulation, all four channels can reach up to uh, 100 milliamps, which is a lot. Um, if, you're, if you have the extended version so both versions read the emg over 2048 hertz but the extended version actually sends that complete information in the computer while the basic versions only sends the 20 hertz uh, um, kind of sampling rate which is the rms signal uh, to the tablet i have a, another so, question actually coming yes? in for you go ahead 
Um, some individuals here have the uh, the uh, previous version of our hardware, MyoTrack, and they're just wondering, mm -hmm. the Myonics, does it do similar sort of protocols where you can mix working and resting as well as mixing in the, that stim? So does it do similar type protocols like that? Absolutely. So um, doing bio, uh, biofeedback sessions on the app, and let me uh, pull up my app again real quick. So doing biofeedback sessions on the app, you have different uh, modes so the classic and what we usually use is the work rest mode so if i click on the left top of the screen the little uh, menu button i get access to all the settings here i can set the work time and the rest time as well as of course the complete procedure time um, and as you can see the thresholds i can decide on their uh, condition if i want it above or below uh, regarding timing if i want to have an open session that doesn't have work and rest, I just click the open session. So work and rest are now grayed out and I have a session that's just continuous. Uh, I can also have what we call an alternating uh, work rest session, which instead of work and then rest and both channels work and rest at the same time, we only have work time. And then you have 20 seconds in this instance, uh, 20 seconds to work with A and then 20 seconds to work with B. So again, flexibility, we're giving you all the options. You can uh, set your own protocols, and uh, after you set all the settings you want, you can save it, give it any name you want. Uh, one thing to mention, if I'm using a patient, I already uh, selected a patient before I start the session. Um, I, I finish the session. Next time I open this device and choose that same patient, uh, this same settings will show up. So it gives me quick access even if I don't save them. But if I want, I can save it as a protocol and use it for other patients as well. I just click save and give it any name I want. And now I have that as a protocol, and I can load it uh, later on from the same menu. All right. Thanks, Keva. Mm -hmm. uh, for uh, combining, um, about combining EMG and STIM, so we, we do have ETS, uh, like we see here on the app. So um, that will give me access to the EMG triggered STIM modality, and I'll be able to uh, control the STIM using the EMG signal. Uh, another thing to mention, in Biograph, we don't have access to ETS or uh, STIM. So Biograph is uh, strictly biofeedback. So a little bit about the app. Uh, like I said, very easy to, to get. You just download it from the marketplace. Um, the device comes with a little barcode you can scan or you can just search Myonics on the market. Um, it works with uh, gestures. So everything we're very used to working on on tablets, pinch to zoom, drag and drop, um, swipe between views. Um, we have quick access, like you saw, to all the modalities. So stimulation, ETS, biofeedback, just by clicking it from the uh, menu. Um, we can uh, reach the, all the uh, electrostimulation programs uh, and then edit them, create new ones, and even upload these onto the device. So later on, when I work on the device as standalone, I can use a program I already programmed uh, beforehand, and I'll have quick access to that. And when working with the device, if we lose connection or if we uh, go to a different room and we we'll want to separate, the, the session will keep working on the hardware Myonix device itself, even if we're not looking at it or we disconnect with the, with the app. So sessions will complete as described. Uh, on the app, we have a clinician login. This is done with a username, which is an email address and a password. Of course, we have a remember me option so for easy access. You'll have to enter your password each time. Um, each therapist or each user will have his own separate uh, patient files. So you don't have access to other therapist patient files, even if you're in the same clinic. Um, the patient files are basically just uh, the patient's name and a user unique ID that you decide to give them. It can be an ID number, phone number, uh, whatever is comfortable for the therapist. Um, like I said, each patient, when you select the patient, when you start uh, go into biofeedback screen or ETS screen, uh, it will automatically load the last, last session you already did with him for quick and easy access. Um, 
and then when yeah. you're done uh, with uh, with uh, with a session, it will save it. Uh, if you want, it will ask you if you want. But if you do, it will save it into the patient file, and then you can later review it and generate a report. Um, one more thing to say before I let you talk, Pedro, is uh, you don't have to select the patient for working. You can also work anonymously if you don't want to save the session and you just want to do kind of on the go um, sessions. Go ahead, Pedro. Sorry. Oh yeah. So I was just just want to say that even though I uh, I helped developing this, there are so many cool features that, and some of them I wasn't aware, and this was one of them. And when I saw, it, I said, "Wow, this is a deal breaker. This is a deal. This, this would make the deal for me, which is being able to to have sessions per user." So the device can be used by different therapists without confidentiality problems, which is a really, really cool thing to have on a device like this because it can stand on the chain and you can give access to the different therapists without uh, worrying that information will be shared with uh, someone that it shouldn't. Uh, so it was really <laughs> nice to see it when I saw it on this presentation, but congrats. Absolutely, and it also makes it uh, possible to work in big uh, centers and hospitals. With yeah, yeah. And usually, it was when I used it uh, to present the Mayo tract, they would say, "Yeah, but uh, we, we will probably need a device per per person." And it, it's, most devices, like small devices, work like that. So you don't have this capable. You're not capable of having this. Uh, Rule, so it's yeah. really cool, and this definitely helps get uh, get over that hurdle. Yeah. Um, so biofeedback uh, on the app, uh, we have like we said two channels. Uh, we have they have different uh, separate scales, one on the left and one on the right. We can adjust those individually. So if I'm looking at a smaller muscle on channel B and a larger on channel A, I can zoom more in on channel B and zoom more out on, on channel A. Um, they have, of course, uh, also separate thresholds. I can, when I, like you saw before, when I click biofeedback, I immediately get to the screen that we see right now on our screen. So it's uh, the live preview. I can make sure the signal is, uh, is good and clean. I can set all the little settings of the protocol and then I can start a protocol which will be calculated and saved. Um, of course, like you saw, change, switch between types of views. I can select audio feedback. We have nice music going on when uh, one for relaxation and one for uh, contraction. Um, we have, uh, you can set thresholds. So uh, we talked about um, static thresholds, the manual and uh, auto. So auto threshold will just keep changing and adapt to the patient's abilities. Uh, dynamic are what I mentioned uh, previously in the, be in the beginning of uh, the presentation. Uh, dynamic thresholds are kind of uh, thresholds that you give them a time interval and a, and a, a, a kind of a rate to go up and down. Um, and then the, the word I was looking for was a range. Sorry, <laughs> you give it a range uh, to go up and down within. And then these uh, thresholds will kind of uh, request the patient to be some of the time above them, some of the time below them, and they keep changing and giving a uh, moving target. Um, while you're in session, you can uh, mark events. There's a little button on the bottom. You can just click it and mark events. So if the patient sneezed, if he fell, if something happened, you just mark that. And then later on, on the review screen, you can actually give that event a name before uh, saving it. Uh, you have maximum voluntary contraction calculations, meaning uh, it will you will see on the screen a little dot showing you what's the highest the patient reached. Uh, throughout the session, and this is a continuous kind of calculation throughout the session. Um, and like I said, any protocol you you adjust, any settings you adjust, and any protocol you can create, you can then save it and use it uh, at any time. Yeah, I'm just going to find out one small thing that also is really cool to have, which is that those event markers can also be used when you're on an open session, but you're asking the person or paying attention to some details of movement for example when you're looking at the shoulder uh, section and you want to to know when it got uh, gone above 85 degrees so that you see the change on the muscle pattern mm -hmm. you can quickly use that to put to put it into your session so that when you're reviewing you know it was at that point that muscles should revert 
the, the contraction be, uh, between the uh, lower and upper. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. So you can use that uh, for whatever um, uh, means yeah. you want. Um, electrostimulation. So we said electrostimulation we can do on the device as a handheld, as a standalone, uh, but we, we are also able to access it from the app itself. And then we can run uh, live sessions from the app, or we can uh, create a session and save it and then use it later from the device. Uh, in the app, we do have access not just to programs, uh, but also to uh, all the specific individual settings. So uh, pulse width, pulse rate, uh, modulation types, all the timings, the ramp up time, the work time, the rest time. Um, we have access to all of that. We can create uh, very detailed uh, protocols the way we like them, give them a name and, and save them. Um, another thing to mention is we can definitely use uh, two separate programs at the same time. Uh, so one program for channels A and B and one for C and D in case we're working with uh, two separate patients or different needs for the same patient at the same time. Um, and while you're in session in, uh, in stim mode, you see uh, how much time is left, what the amplitude is on the, of the current currently. Uh, and, uh, and all the timers. One more thing you can do with uh, STIM, like I said, uh, if we click the programs button, I can drag and drop programs from the app into the device and vice versa from the device into the app. Very easy just by drag and dropping any already created program. ETS looks very similar to uh, biofeedback on the app. We get uh, only two types of views. It's the line graph and the bar graph. Uh, in ETS, after we set all the settings, which include uh, what type of uh, electrical current I want, the waveform, uh, and all the timings, and of course, the thresholds. After I set all those up, I can uh, adjust the amplitude and start a session. Uh, ETS can be done with one channel. Uh, it can be done with two channels simultaneously, which means I will have to reach a threshold on both channels to activate STIM on both channels. Or we have an alternating kind of session, which will go through the entire cycle on channel A and then the entire cycle on channel B. The cycle is, of course, a work phase where you have to kind of contract and reach the threshold, then a STIM phase where you, the electrostimulation kicks in, and then a rest phase, letting the muscles relax after the um, the operation um, and the, all these can be adjusted. Um, we ha also have two types of work phases, so uh, finite and infinite, where uh, finite you will give it a specific timing. I would say um, work phase is 10 seconds, for example, and then if the patient reached within the 10 seconds, reached the threshold, stim will kick in. If he didn't reach it, he will go to rest mode and then to work mode again. That's in finite. If I go use infinite, uh, there is no duration for the work phase. So it, the, the patient will keep trying until he reaches the threshold and then STIM will kick in. All right, so we have some, actually you go ahead to finish the review section then I'll bring in some questions from the participants. Okay, so review we already kind of went through. You saw the, the, generation, the report generation. In review, I can name the event markers. I can create new markers. Uh, I can obviously save it to the patient file. I can zoom in and out. Uh, I, I can see the uh, over the entire session uh, the signal as well as the maximum voluntary contraction and uh, the thresholds at any time on the graph itself. It also gives me access to all the different types of statistics. All right, so I just have collections of questions from different individuals uh, going back to what we've been talking about for the last five minutes. Uh, so just mm -hmm. to clarify, the device does do two channels of EMG biofeedback, but up to four of STIM, correct? Exactly, that is correct. Okay, perfect. Now someone is asking, is it possible that you can actually be recording a session and compare it to a previous session, but in real time? So on one side, you're getting the, the, the live data and the other session you're comparing to a past session? Data. Uh, we don't have that option. You, you could compare them uh, manually by yourself. We don't have that uh, as a feature on the app. Uh, Biograph has that option, but you need to know how to create it and use it. It's a okay. power tool. Uh, 
uh, another question is, um, when you save a protocol that you just made, is it available to all the users on the device or only listed under that certain client or patient's name? So uh, it's per uh, clinician. It's not per um, th um, patient. Right. Okay, so yeah, if the clinician added in, then it has available to their list. Over all patients, yeah. Okay, all right. And, uh, another one is, um, can you choose the, um, the, the ES parameters? Is, is that something you can set yourself or is that all automatically done? Absolutely, you can set it. Let me just uh, load the screen of my app again. So I'll show you how that's done. It's very, very simple. So if I go into uh, programs here, I see the list of programs that are currently on the app. I click the little plus button on the bottom right. It takes me to this screen in which I can adjust all the settings, including uh, frequency, pulse width, the type of delivery, all the timings, and then I can save it, give it a, a name, okay. all and, right. uh, and have access to it later uh, from here. Now, another thing I can do, once I created a program, I can click the uh, little uh, other icon of the two windows on the bottom right, and then I see on the left, I see all the devices, all the programs that are on the app. And on the right, I see all the programs on the device. And I can just drag and drop them and move them from one to the other. So then later, I can just start the device and have access to all those directly from there. Excellent. Um, only two more questions and I'll let you go. I realize we've already had an hour of time pass. For save sessions from the uh, the Bionics or the app onto a computer to be analyzed by another program like MATLAB, or is that only via Biograph? Can we transfer the raw data? Uh, right now, we can only do that through Biograph. So you can uh, export data from Biograph. So uh, data advanced feature. Yeah, yeah so it ha you can do this with the extended version, but you need to do it from Biograph. Um, the, um, uh, it's worth to mention that you can, there is a setting on the hardware device itself that allows you to save any session you did, doesn't matter if you did it with the app or with the uh, software, and it saves it internally, in addition to whatever you save on the app and the software. And okay. those you can have access to from any other uh, software. Perfect. And, uh, one last question. We're looking at the app in English, but does it come in other languages? Yes, uh, the app will adjust itself to whatever uh, language the system is in. Perfect. All right, I'll let you go ahead just so you know we've, an hour's already passed. Okay, let's uh, try to go uh, through this uh, quickly. So like we said, uh, on our PC software, the, it's very, very powerful. So you can select any type of uh, video you want. It, again, it gives you more tools. And within this software, you can create your own screens and, and build it the way you like it. So that's the power of uh, biofeedback of um, Biograph Infinity. Um, again, we tried to get entertained and more engaged within the process. It's, I think the number one thing with biofeedback is keeping the, the patient entertained and, uh, and engaged. And uh, now we want to talk a little bit, uh, let uh, Pedro kind of lead, I think, uh, this part of the uh, discussion uh, what 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 biofeedback is good for <laughs> okay so we have gone through uh, the time we had scheduled for today so uh, we won't be able to go as deep as we would like to but uh, basically you can uh, like I said from the beginning you can use it uh, on any surface muscle uh, that is producing movement and that is relevant to the activity that you're wanting to monitor, either being it on orthopedic or in the neuro, um, neurology cases, or specific ones like, for example, for the pelvic floor, as we've spoken before. We can uh, put into action all the cool features that Kiva has uh, shown us today. Uh, and use it uh, either to have train a muscle if the muscle has been the condition or down train if it's too tight for example uh, a person that is working in front of the computer all day and needs to, to learn and understand how to relax the upper trapezius and 
And uh, as we saw, it, it, we can even use the steam in conjunction with the EMG or by itself as a combining uh, tool. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, if if anybody has kind of uh, questions about uh, uses in orthopedic um, patients, <clears throat> this would be a good time to ask. Um, I would just like to to add that is uh, um, in orthopedic, I see the most use for it in very very weak muscles, uh, in internal muscles, uh, pel things like pelvic floor. Uh, things that the patient is hard for him to to understand and quantify how he he's doing the the effort, uh, as well as uh, when we're trying to compare between uh, small fibers, if the uh, VMO with uh, vastus lateralis, um, uh, things like that, and of course to add a little bit interest uh, to uh, tedious tasks. So a good example I always uh, have of that is uh, when I used to work in a hospital, we used to give a lot of um, static quads exercises. So the patient would be in bed and we just ask him to uh, contract his quad without moving the leg. And this is, first of all, a lot of the times hard to understand for the patient. And secondly, uh, very boring because you have to do that a lot uh, throughout the day. So uh, giving a little animation and asking the patient, just try to make the animation run or as long as you're making, as you're doing it right, uh, you can keep watching this uh, YouTube movie. Uh, this will make it a little bit more interesting, a little bit more fun. Um, and of course, if we're looking for assisted active, ETS is a great tool for that, right? Yeah. Uh, easier to see, of course, uh, the uses for this in, in neurologic uh, patients. So uh, neurologic patients, a lot of the time, uh, especially post-stroke, uh, post-SCI, would have uh, uh, sensory uh, deficits, would have... Uh, um, uh, problem with the connections between um, the brain and the muscle, uh, so the neural uh, pathways, uh, and, and, uh, and this would be very, very useful to help them overcome these kinds of uh, deficits and problems. Um, any specific uh, uses you would want to talk about, uh, Pedro? Yeah, I have, I, like, I, like uh, John pointed out, we are already at past the hour, but uh, I think one thing that is really important when we're talking about neurologic cases is that this is a really powerful tool. One thing that we need, because usually they don't have access to the information of, in terms of proprioception and they don't have the way of doing it correctly, so feedback comes handy. One thing that we need to always point out is that they need to understand uh, so they need to be capable of understanding what we're asking of them in order to take full, yeah, to take full everything that we can give them with us. Absolutely. Um, then of course pelvic floor. I mentioned that a little bit in the um, orthopedic section. Uh, with pelvic floor, because these are deep muscles, we are all aware of how difficult it is to explain to a patient uh, and to measure when he's doing, uh, when she or he is doing the correct uh, action. Pelvic floor uh, biofeedback is uh, uh, super useful in teaching Kegels and teaching relaxation of muscles. So down training, up training, and the even uh, controlling with two channels, you can uh, make sure you separate between say abdominal or buttock muscles and the actual internal muscles you're trying to activate. Yeah, and, and, and uh, I would use this time to, to pay an homage to a guy that was really important, at least to me, but I think to Sotec in general, which, are, which was Howard Glazer and the work he has done on pelvic floor. We had the pleasure of having him uh, yeah, as a, a mentor and uh, have all his insights uh, about uh, how to measure pelvic floor and uh, we certainly came from it and uh, most of the things that were put into this device came from his work um, and it can be used for not only incontinence but also for so many other things like uh, and vaginal pain uh, through penetration and so any condition where pelvic floor muscles can be uh, involved, a 
having access to them by Kaggle we used to say it's the only way of doing a Kaggle this is if you have biofeedback it isn't used as CMT but it's still used by feedback uh, to do it and uh, he said and every time that you shouldn't do the Kaggles without biofeedback yeah. so to stress again why we're so much better than anybody else out there we are um, physiotherapists dedicated into creating a device for physiotherapists and centered around the patients. Uh, this device was not uh, dreamt of uh, by uh, um, designers or uh, um, just people sitting in a lab. Uh, this took uh, the, the beginning of the work on this device was uh, traveling the world and asking uh, therapists from all, all around the world, what are the things you need? what you're looking at. And we really came down to these kind of concepts, making it easy, making it function, keeping it functional, making it fun. Uh, like Pedro uh, stressed before, going through all the stages of rehab. So we have passive, we have assisted active and active. Um, we are sticking to the concept of motor learning, which is such a big deal for physiotherapists and for other rehabilitation therapists as well, of course. Uh, we can uh, select and moderate the type the quantity, the timing, the batching of the feedback, which is so important as you progress through uh, the session. Um, the, uh, the wireless ability allows us to keep the device uh, on the patient while he's moving. Like I said a couple of times before, uh, as physiotherapists, um, active training is so important to us. It's such a big deal. It change, it's a game changer. Uh, and of course, keeping the patient engaged, like I said, is the number one rule, keeping them entertained, make it fun, animations, games, music. Um, and then uh, I think one of the major differences between our device and, uh, and devices out there are uh, the open environment kind of attitude. So we trust the therapist to know uh, what he's trying to achieve and to create their own uh, sessions and protocols and, and uh, understand what they're looking at and what they want to do with the patient. And we're not giving out like these uh, dedicated protocols that are, you know, right now do this, now do that, because every patient like we know is different. Every therapist is different. And uh, we're really putting, trying to put all this power in the hands of the therapist while keeping it very simple to use and giving her all the options uh, to, to create any type of session they want. So designed by clinicians for clinicians, patient-centered. This is really a big, big deal for us. And that is it for today. If anybody has uh, any more questions, now is the time for me or Pedro, or even John. <laughs> I don't have any personal questions right now, but <laughs> yes, that is the last chance. We'd like to thank everyone who's attended, by the way. and. Uh, Sorry for going a little old time, but that's absolutely fine. There's just so much information we want to share. Um, yeah, there's just some individuals who are thanking us for the presentation because I think they have to get going as well. Okay, thank you all so very much. Uh, okay. It's uh, our pleasure, and we are uh, always uh, open to hear your opinions and questions. Thanks for joining us today. Thank Perfect. you very, thank you very much, everyone. Bye bye. <laughs>